Uh, well, the reason why I want to do this, uh, aside from it being Black History Month, is that this last year, the United States has been going through a racial reckoning, a reevaluation in many, many different ways. And I truly believe that this was actually almost the first glimmer of this ongoing process of racial recognition, racial justice. And I wanted to talk about the Harlem Renaissance and its role in all this that has influenced, I think, the civil rights movement of the 50s and 60s and right up to Black Lives Matter today to, because they chose to speak out and this is how they did it. We're having a little technical problem there. It's not advancing. Let's try it. Ah, got it. All right, uh, the button that was supposed to work didn't. But uh, anyway, you know, if you want to know what it was, it was an early flower, in the early 20th century flower in African American arts, letters, political life. And it's most closely identified with New York City. However, there were other areas, pretty much every place that African Americans then moved to in the North had some sort of variation of it. And some of them were Chicago, Detroit, Kansas City, and St. Louis. And uh, it was really all over the place. But uh, it actually, this picture is very illustrative of the feeling of the time because in the car and have a big sign saying, the new Negro has no fear. And of course, that was the shtick of the past. It was fear, it was intimidation, it was lynching. And we're gonna cover a little bit of everything here. Hey, well, you know, we sort of know why it happened, but we're gonna go over it again. I mean, it was so repressive in the South for African Americans. Uh, the laws, for instance, they had to pay poll taxes right up until the 1960s. And it was specifically designed to keep African Americans from voting because they had less wherewithal to, to write the vote. And so a lot of uh, people thought, why are we staying here? And they decided to gradually migrate from the South to the North to find better jobs and lives. And of course, the technology facilitated this. They were, you know, the rail fares were cheaper as they became more efficient. The trains were faster. They started things like interstate bus lines, which are actually very new. The Greyhound started in 1911. Before that, there simply wasn't anything like that. And, uh, so it was much easier to transplant yourself. And uh, they went to find, you know, better jobs. And this is an ad from uh, a Chicago newspaper. And these were carried in Southern papers too. They, they even actually, some people, industry sent agents down to go around the countryside and try to persuade people to leave and go north. And it's sort of interesting. It shows you the racism of the day because it shows you what kind of jobs were available. And uh, for basically for men, it was butlers, porters, waiters, and cooks. And for women, it was general housework, cooks, maids, laundresses. And, uh, but I thought uh, I liked in the employment office is that they advertise a private waiting parlor for ladies and a lounging room for men. And I take that to mean is that they could smoke and chew tobacco. <laughs> but uh, anyway, it was so, uh, and this is a picture of a contemporary family getting ready to move north. And this on the left is a map. Uh, according to the history.com website, between 1916 and 1970, it said 6 million people moved. So that's, that's why they call it the Great Migration. 
And of course, here in the library, you can actually learn more about it. And this is an excellent book called The Warmth of Other Suns. And we have an audio version here, but there are formats all available all through the library system. Uh, large print, regular print, um, all, all different kinds of ways. And all you need is a library card. Now, this is sort of interesting because as people started moving into Harlem, which was originally named for a, a town in New Netherlands, in Netherlands, in Holland. And uh, it was actually originally farm country. And then when the elevated train lines were built heading from to the north and end of Manhattan, it got to be more affordable for white middle class people to move there because they could get to work in like 45 minutes, which was a tremendous improvement. But gradually, one way or another, it began to uh, become more African American. And there were a couple of reasons, like uh, where the present Central Park is now, the northern end of the park was a pre Black colony dating back to the early 19th century. So, in some way or other, there was always this nucleus in Harlem. And maybe that's how we got to be the Harlem Renaissance. But there's this wonderful website called Ephemeral New York, which actually shows New York history. And uh, they're talking about the tree of hope, which was planted to be very aspirational to these new people coming into Harlem. And uh, there were actually two trees there. It was considered to be good luck, mostly for entertainers. They believe people like uh, Ubi Blake and Ethel Waters touched the tree for luck. And uh, the first tree died and they had Bill Gojangles Robinson plant a new one. And uh, um, alas, though, Seventh <laughs> Avenue had to be widened and so the tree was chopped down. But you can still see uh, this tree of hope dedicated to the new people coming into Harlem, the new people who wanted a better life for their race and for themselves. And it's, it's right there. Anyone can go and see it. Uh, another factor that led to the Northern migration was World War I because uh, taking up from what they had done in the past, starting with the, the American Revolution, there were always some sort of African-Americans fighting for the United States. And in this particular case, they, this particular unit, they were uh, you know, certified for actual bravery by the French. They actually won the Croix de Guerre. And, uh, but when they got back home, it, it was a different story. And they had to face uh, segregation and they had to face all different kinds of trials. And they began to become much more impatient. And because of that, they believed that it began to become a, a, an actual social movement called the New Negro Movement. And that's where I remember I, in the first slide, I said, the New Negro has no fear. Well, you know, that was, that was one of their themes. And this is what it was. Uh, it was supposed to be a new way for African Americans to think about themselves. It was supposed to be a new way to convince the greater white world in the United States that to have another look at them. And it said the new Negro stressed cultural awareness of their, their roots, self-confidence, assertiveness, and self-defense. And uh, even in Kwanzaa, some of the attributes that were promoted for Kwanzaa actually sort of draw on this to some degree. Because I mean, the New York, the North was in no ways totally desegregated, but it was much less stringent. Uh, I mean, I've seen a lot of old old pictures of people then on like the subway, and I mean, nobody was particularly chummy, but. African Americans did not have to be in a separate car or in the back of a car. That never happened. And uh, so it was much easier lifestyle for these people. 
And this is the byproduct uh, of the great migration that, you know, less stringent racial attitudes. There were a lot of ways you could get by with a lot of things and it's helped sponsor things like, you know, magazines, newspapers. And of course, this was the crisis, which was actually uh, helmed by James Weldon Johnson. And we will see more of him later, but this was a newspaper paper to serve a greater new public. And this April 23, 1923 was 15 cents, which would, it sounds cheap, but it really wasn't. It would be almost $4 today. And, uh, but just to have this platform allowed writers, poets, and illustrators, uh, photographers, it gave them a venue. And I thought the crisis title I mean, because they knew that thing, this was going to drift out. The NAACP published it. They had a wide readership and that it would start getting out into the wider world. And so they wanted to impress on the United States that there was a crisis. And as we are seeing now with Black Lives Matter, they are together, they are out on streets saying, you know, this is something that matters. Mm -hmm. And so it, it was a really interesting period. And I'll show you, this is sort of their wide reach. This is sort of a wonderful Venn diagram I found. And uh, this, there is, what, oops, sorry, <laughs> I'll go back, uh, was uh, writers. Uh, these are mostly intellectuals, James Baldwin Johnson, Author Schomburg, there's a wonderful library at 125th Street named for him. He had this huge collection of African and African American works, which he made available to the New York Public Library. And they also, some of the writers and poets were Zora Neale Hurston, which we know about, uh, Richard Bruce Nugent, Langston Hughes. And in the yellow down here, they called them Negrotarian patrons. These were, you know, middling to powerful white people who supported the Harlem Renaissance. And one of them was uh, the author Fanny Hurst. If you ever saw Imitation of Life and uh, ba Backstreet, she wrote those. Now, this is also part of the crisis and the NAACP's mission to try to dramatize injustice. And uh, this was a flag that they hung from their office on Fifth Avenue whenever they received a report of someone being lynched somewhere in America. And there's actually a, a new museum that's trying to catalog and find out just how many African Americans were lynched in the United States. So this is an ongoing project, but it was very controversial at the time, but they they did it. That's that's what they did. I thought, you know, one of the things that really promoted and like the crisis and other magazines, newspapers started promoting African inspired art. And I like this one because this woodcut and uh, this young man, he's proud, his head is uplifted and he's surrounded by huge urban buildings. And I took this to mean that the message was is that the city, not the rural countryside would provide a key to the future of the African-American at that time. Now, they were also very into social justice. And these two uh, were painted by Aaron Douglas. And these were two of the nine Scottsboro boys. And if you've never heard of this, they were one of the great liberal causes and Harlem Renaissance causes of the 1930s. These boys were uh, convicted and tried through several trials of raping two white women in a boxcar, and a railroad boxcar. 
which a lot of people were traveling in the depression. They couldn't afford to buy a ticket, so they hopped the freight. And uh, now these girls, uh, these young women, they there was no fiscal evidence, uh, and one of them actually recanted, saying that nothing had occurred. And yet every single trial, these young men were convicted, and they were never actually sentenced to be executed, but they spent most the rest of their lives in jail. And uh, it was racism. It was, I mean, there was no proof they had done anything with these women. But the mere thought to a white jury of that period that uh, they would even think of doing that because that was one of the letter motives of uh, the segregation Jim Crow era, the purity of white women and to protect them. I mean, it fueled things like the Ku Klux Klan and a lot of other things going on. But uh, now, as you see, this portrait is in, in the Smithsonian. And here's another accomplished artist, which you may not have heard about, but uh, Augustus Savage was a very big person on the art scene in Harlem. She was very well known, maybe not as well known today, and on the left, this is a picture of her most famous work. And it's called Lift Every Voice and Sing, which is written by James Weldon Johnson. And it actually is considered to be, from what I've read and heard, the unofficial anthem of African-Americans. And uh, the way it was done, it has a choir and graduated uh, in choir robes, this is the strings of the harp, and uh, the the bass is the hand and uh, arm of God, and uh, the man kneeling in front is the sounding board. I mean, Miss Savage was accustomed, uh, accomplished enough that she actually uh, had this uh, on display at the New York World's Fair in 1939-1940. Uh, the problem, it was in the Contemporary Arts Building, but the problem was is that there was no money to have it actually cast in bronze. And uh, when the fair closed in 1940, this piece and all the rest of the art was destroyed. And it was such a tragic loss, but at least we have the pictures. Now, of course, you know, one of the big things about uh, the Harlem Renaissance was also its sort of nightclub scene because, I mean, popular or orchestras like, uh, you know, Duke Ellington, Cap Calloway, I mean, they were able to sort of break out of the confines of playing obscure little clubs just for people in Harlem to actually become within the limits of their period to be actually quite famous and their music went out into the greater white world. And uh, one of the things is, is that a lot of people, adventurous whites would take the A train <laughs> and go up to Harlem to listen to these people. And as the word spread, other people start to take notice. In one way or another, they wound up in, 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 in cinema they wound up in the press, photo photography, radio, movies. And like I said, the African-American style of music actually started to go out. In fact, Cole Porter himself, his most famous, uh, one of his most famous pieces was Begin to Begin. And he used uh, African and Brazilian rhythms. So the word was definitely getting out. And uh, this is a, a, a singer. She was also part of the sound, uh, the, the sound at that time. Her name was Alberta Hunter. And uh, she had such a long career. She actually outlasted the Renaissance itself. And I know because she was singing well into the 1970s in the New York cabaret scene. And actually, I was lucky enough to be in the audience twice. And uh, so she, she was definitely part of the scene too. And this was the cotton club. This is where a lot of them sprang from. And uh, 
it was interesting because the owners were white, the talent was black, uh, Ethel Waters, Cap Calloway, Ellington was the house band. And they, in those days, because they would allow mixed white and black audiences, it was called the Black and Tan Club. And that was, even in New York, that was far from common. And uh, usually if you, it was so successful at the time that you could actually, uh, they actually, the owners got a bigger place in Times Square on 48th Street, Broadway. And if you Google it in images and put in Cotton Club, that's the image you'll get. But this picture right here, that was the real deal. This is where everybody, everybody was. Now, Lady Day was also singing during that whole period. And her most famous contribution was a song she composed and it was racially based and it was known as Strange Fruit. And as a special treat, we were able to find something on YouTube uh, that will actually show you, you can hear her singing it and uh, you can actually see the lyrics. And this was so controversial at the time, Columbia Records, which was her label, actually uh, they uh, released her for one recording session in order to record this because they didn't want her to do it for the Columbia label because they were afraid of the reaction it would get in the South. And it tell, uh, I'll tell you, it did not take much to irritate Southern Democrats in those days on racial issues. There's actually a famous incident with First Lady Eleanor Roosevelt. She attended a meeting in Birmingham, Alabama, where in an unprecedented manner, they actually had black and white civic leaders to discuss mutual problems brought on by the depression. Well, they automatically placed the first lady in the white section and she felt uncomfortable with that. And she asked her chair to be put in the aisle between both sides of the audience. And there was a fury unleashed in the Southern press that would be unbelievable today. So you can just get an idea of how big this song was. And just give it a few seconds, it, it'll actually start. Oh, 
tears of fruit all the crows to pluck all the rain together all the wind to suck trouble here. Just give me a minute. Sorry, everyone. We'll be ready in a minute. Okay. Sorry about that, <laughs> but uh, anyway, here's some other figures that were part of the scene then. But before I talk about Mr. Cullen, uh, there's this strange anomaly about her reporting. It's that my sources indicate that she sold a million copies of this in 1939 when she originally recorded it, but uh, it wasn't until 1941 when the Miller Band was actually awarded the prize of a gold record for selling a million copies for uh, Chattanooga Choo Choo. So that sort of encapsulates how people thought back then. But anyway, Mr. Cullen, uh, he actually was sort of this young man about town <laughs> in Harlem. This picture was most probably taken in Central Park. And uh, by 1929, he had several books of his own poetry. And uh, he also had uh, an anthology called Caroling Dusk of other African-American writers. So he was a novelist, a children's story writer, and a playwright. So he was definitely what we would call multitasking. And it actually bore fruit because if you go to New York, this is the County Cullen branch of the New York Public Library. It is the very first city library branch actually dedicated to an African American. And it's still there today and they said make special, you know, uh, mention of him and have special displays and all sorts of things. Now here's James Weldon Johnson. He was you know, he was a novelist, a poet, a songwriter. Of course, we know he wrote Lift Every Voice and Sing. Um, he, he was, as well as an attorney, he was a U.S. counsel in a foreign nation. And uh, he was, also had, for about almost 20 years, at the top position. Uh, he was the editor of The Crisis, and he was in the, one of the leaders of the NAACP. So he was definitely very much in it. And Langston Hughes, now he was known mostly as a poet, but his uh, work included fields uh, of prose and music. Now, some of his poems are uh, these, The Negro Speaks of Rivers, Harlem, A Dream Deferred, The Weary Blues, I Too Sing America, and Mother to Son. And they speak a lot about the black condition of that period. 
And he was also an influence on uh, Lorraine Hansberry, who took a line from his poem, Harlem, A Dream Deferred, and named her play A Raisin in the Sun. And you actually, there are 11, 21 other sites in Harlem that are actually affiliated with the Harlem Renaissance. And this was uh, Langston Hughes' home. Uh, you can't go in it because it's privately owned, but you can look outside and see a historic plaque. Uh, sometimes <laughs> there's been this ongoing thing with the city and the Municipal Arts Council about moving the shrubbery so that people can see the plaque. And uh, they're still working on that. Now, uh, the National Park Service actually has a whole page dedicated to not only him, but his home, how long he lived there, what things were written there. And uh, so it's definitely worth seeking out. And W.E.B. Du Bois was the first, he was the first African American to ever earn a doctorate degree. And he was literally the personification of the Renaissance being older than most everyone else, he sort of was a leading father figure. And uh, he, his collection, he wrote a series of essays called The Souls of Black Folk. And he also uh, did a wonderful thing about uh, reconstruction in America. And he actually went full on against the prevailing uh, opinion by white historians that the Negro was responsible for all the failures of the reconstruction period, which is definitely not true. And uh, he's one of the people who actually specified something called the color line to point out the inequalities in the Supreme Court decision of separate but equal facilities for uh, whites and African-Americans in this country because they were never equal. It was as simple as that. And uh, so uh, he's the one who published, uh, he worked on a lot of different things. And uh, we actually have a very, very nice uh, biography. And you can actually go into the bees, I mean, uh, Dubois and, uh, so anyway, let's see, there's a couple, yeah, it's B de Bois, so uh, that's where you find it. And of course, you know, because of Eatonville, where she was born, you can, there's an awful lot of things about Zora Neale Hurston. And she actually, she's best known for their eyes were watching God, but she was one of the most prolific Renaissance authors at that time said over a 30 year career, she, uh, she published four novels, two books of folklore, an autobiography, numerous short stories, and several essays, articles, and plays. And while not always commercially successful all the time, she was definitely a presence in African American and American letters in her time. And these are just some of the things. We have many, many books by her, some about her in the, the library. So it's definitely worth going into the catalog to see what we've got. Now, to learn more, these are some of the things you can do. You can go into the catalog at uh, www.mylakelibrary.org, which I'm sure you have all have memorized. Uh, you should also go into our subscription databases and they have a lot of things there. We have things in Overdrive and Libby ebook collection and uh, some places outside of the library would be university. And I'm talking about traditionally African-American universities like Howard or uh, literary foundation sites. And there's a lot of foundations dedicated to these authors and their works. Um, and if you're not too aware of it, we actually have access to something called the Florida Electronic Library. 
and you can get to it through our databases and it's a wonderful uh, source. Just I just put in Harlem Renaissance. It's one simple two word search. I got 2,548 magazines, 2,928 academic journals, 357 books, 4,781 news articles and six videos. And you can actually filter everything. You can filter by publication date, title, lexile measure, reading level. And so there's a lot of different things you can, you can do with this. Like this article is Legacy, Women Poets of the Harlem Renaissance. Uh, so there's a lot of stuff there and I would really urge you to go in and, and try it out. You'll find a lot of, a lot of good things there. And also we actually have a great database which is only available to Leesburg Lake County users because the city of Leesburg pays for it, the county does not, and it's called Canopy. And so I typed again Harlem Renaissance and I actually got two right here. I got the Harlem Renaissance and Beyond and Use Dream Harlem, Langston Use Harlem's Poet Laureate. So I also urge you to actually get into that. And if you're wondering if you have, uh, whether you can with your card, if your card says 23099, that is the Leesburg code. You can get into all the city databases as well as the actual um, accounting databases. And it's, we're still, you know, all part of the Lake County system. And it's well worth switching out your card. We also have more fun things like Hoopla, which you might enjoy too. And this at the end, uh, basically, this is the heart of Harlem. This is a vintage uh, shot of 125th Street, which stretches all the way across the island. And uh, just sort of sum up, uh, even though it's a prodigious legacy that I think still affects, uh, you know, uh, African American thought and liberal thought today. But it's also going through a, a rather interesting period itself because it, once seen as the Mecca for African-American life in this country, it has started to slip. Uh, in the last 20 or so years, more and more uh, white people have been buying, the area has been gentrifying. And so they're losing some of the original spirit of what made you know, African-American Harlem, Harlem, and its role in the future and its effect on the future is still undetermined. But I hope you enjoyed this uh, program going through the major points of a huge topic. And I tried to do it as uh, much justice as I could. So I am definitely open to questions if anyone has any. Tom, I have a question. I was wondering when the Apollo Theater became, came into play and became so popular. Oh yeah, uh, well, the Apollo actually started originally as a vaudeville theater for mostly white clientele. It was a lot of Germans up there at the time. And uh, then gradually as the neighborhood changed, uh, they began to you know, develop more you know, African American and of course, they're still there today. And even major stars today, like Nicki Minaj or something, everybody has performed there. Uh, Ella Fitzgerald got her start there. She said that she actually put herself down as a dancer. But when she saw the young couple before her doing their moves, she said, there's no way I'm going to go out there and dance. So she became a singer. <laughs> That's a cute story. Thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. Tom, there, may, yeah. there was a new movie about Billie Holiday. I think that's a brand new movie that's out. Yeah, you're, you're totally correct. It's about uh, her uh, IRS tax problems and how the government at that time made a point to so-called punish her. And it was mostly racially based because uh, 
I mean, uh, all the people involved in the IRS and the FBI and everything at the time, they were all white, middle class, many of them from the South. So they were not going to look kindly upon her. It's supposed to be an extremely good film. Okay. And so if there's no other questions, I want to thank you all for coming and listening to me run on all this time. And just, yeah. Tom, yeah. what are you going to do in retirement? Uh, well, there's a lot of things. We're redecorating our house. Uh, not a lot, but I want to be there for some of it because right now, everyone's doing, we're doing it alone. I'm here and he's there. And I also want to spend a little more time on my health. Um, my goal is to build my back up, myself back up to doing 50 miles a week on my bike. And uh, yeah, we also live right by a park and it has a, a three mile perimeter walking track. So we're gonna start doing that every day and traveling more uh, eventually. I'm already thinking of where to go for next year when hopefully we will all be maskless. <laughs> yeah, no, I mean, I love this <laughs> All right, thank you. I love this job, but it's really time. And I'm glad I have the opportunity to still continue to do programs for everyone. We are very thankful. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Very good, thank you.